the Bible is God's way saying, here I am, you come guys. On. Come come and know me. Like, do you want to know me? Here I am. You, you got to know my whole story here. So it's, it's just so belittling to Jesus to just say, yeah, I only care about the stuff that he said in in red letters well the whole thing is what he said he's the word of god and when he speaks uh he wants us to listen why are there so many translations of the bible are all these bible translations reliable and what do you do with certain bible translations that have those little awkward uh, differences between them these are the questions you've been asking us So let's answer them with someone whose credentials for this are off the charts. Meet my buddy, Ken Kastler. He is the Blue Letters editor of the Jesus-Centered Bible and the author of the Make a Difference Bible. So here we have someone, my boy Ken, who literally edits and curates Bibles. I told you we would hook you up. And as we get into it, please do subscribe and follow our show wherever you're listening, be it on YouTube or Spotify Apple Music, or the TBM Plus app. Subscribe because we are here simply to renew your joy for Scripture. All right, Ken, my buddy, how can the Bible be the the Word of God, the, the reliable Word of God, the trustworthy, the infallible Word of God, if there are so many translations of the Bible? That's a great question, Raj. It's It can be confusing, can't it? I mean, there are hundreds of different translations, thousands actually. If you look around the world, Raj, the Bible's been translated into thousands of languages over the last 2,000 years. So it can be confusing. But here's here's why we have so many translations of Scripture. It's because the Word of God, the Bible, is the most important book, the most important message that's ever been given to humankind. And so we need that word to be read and understood by as many people as possible all around the world. And so uh, people have been working for a long time over continents, over many years, to spread this good news of the gospel through the Bible around the world to people, every tribe, every tongue. We want everybody to have a Bible in their hands and be able to read and understand. Now, I know that uh, obviously the Bible is extremely important to you. Can you kind of walk us through um, kind of your background? I know you talked about you used to put scripture all up on your wall. This has been something that's been burning inside of you for years. So how did you become the Bible guy? Oh, man. So I was 16 years old and I thought, I need to I need to get into this word like the word of God was just blowing me away rush uh, and so I I didn't ask permission I just one night there were some verses I, it might have been Psalm 119 11 your word have I hidden in my heart that I wouldn't sin against you and I thought I probably need to remember that one how am I going to remember it and so I took a, a permanent marker and I just wrote it on my wall and then I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Wait, wait, time so out. The you next wrote day, I permanent did... marker on your wall. Was your mom like on my wall? Too... <laughs> was your mom not too thrilled about that? Well, I didn't. She didn't find out right away because okay. then the next day I thought that's kind of cool. I'm going to put another verse on there, and I put John three sixteen or something like that. And then I just kept adding verses all over the wall. And by the time my mom discovered it a couple of weeks later, I'd already written 30, 40 verses on the wall. And what? <laughs> What mom is going to get mad about that? <laughs> Vandalizing your wall in your bedroom with scripture. So uh, she, she bless her heart, just gave me permission to continue. But she said, you can only do it on this one wall. So I had one wall that became my scripture wall, and I filled it up over the next couple of years. And uh, the word of God's been just central to my life since then. So if you look at different versions, whether it's, you know, the King James or the New Living Translation or the NIV, I think this is a hard point for people to contextualize. It, the words are different, right? Hmm. So how can it be mm-hmm. infallible? How can it be hmm. this, this, you know, people use a lot of words, perfect, infallible, inerrant. If the words themselves, like how can it be the, the divine, here, here you go, guys, word of God, and you kind of already answered this, but 
if the words themselves are different. Yeah, well, I think it's hard for us to remember sometimes that the Bible wasn't written in English. Mm. Uh, a lot of times we think it, it was, because this is how we understand. If we're English-speaking, we read it in English, but we forget there's Spanish-speaking people who read it in Spanish, and German speakers and Chinese speakers, Mandarin, who are reading in those languages. So where, where did the Bible originally come from? What language was it written in? And uh, it's important to know that what we have in Scripture today Day in our languages is an interpretation, a translation of the original languages that the Bible was written in. So mm. uh, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament now, is the Hebrew Bible, and it was written in Hebrew, with a little smattering of Aramaic, actually, in there as well, uh, just a little bit, but mostly Hebrew. And then the New Testament was written in Greek, and actually has some some uh, other phrases in there of other languages as well, but it's 99% Greek. Uh, ancient Greek, so not even current Greek or current Hebrew, but but a reflection of it, kind of like uh, if you were to read Old English today, Raj, mm. uh, from like the 800s, it would be different than our current modern English, right? right? So we right. have to we have to go back and translate, understand and translate the Old Hebrew and the Old Greek, and we've got to translate it then in a way that people can understand it. So it's it really is a, a task of of interpretation. So like a translator helping people understand something in a different language, that's what Bible translators are doing nowadays. They're they're taking the Hebrew and the Greek and they're they're translating into a version of English that they think the readers will be able to understand and comprehend. Hopefully, right, the challenge is without losing the original meaning right. and, and important words of the original languages. So it's, it's always a tension, Raj, for the translator. So there's different methods that have been used, right? So you have things like the ESV. And now correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the Bible guy. Yep where it's kind of more of a word for word translation. Like this right. one says house, well in Spanish it's casa. It's like very the exact same thing. What are some of the other ways that it's translated? I know NIV is more phrases, there's the message, it's more concepts. What are the ways that the Bible is translated in that kind of sense? And is it, what's the word, kosher, okay, that some color has been added to help illuminate the original text? Yeah, I, it's a great question. It's It really helps us understand how to read the Bible, actually, when we understand this point. So if you see it like a spectrum, so on one end is a really kind of tight interpretation, which might be maybe closer to the ESV. It's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a word-for-word -word translation, like you said. Uh, they, they try to be classical in their interpretation in that sense. And the other end of the spectrum might be more loose. So this is going to be more thought for thought. Like, what is the author's meaning, and how could I communicate that in the everyday vernacular of this group of people right here? So mm. maybe people who aren't used to reading the Bible. They don't know religious words, so the interpreter might use in more of an everyday vernacular. Here, here's a great example, uh, a verse that we know really well. So do you want to try a Bible verse? I would love and, to. And, okay, so uh, John 1, 14, right? Okay. So, and the Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Okay, dwelt among us. That's a very popular way to translate it, right? Right. So, but, but on the spectrum of that, that spectrum from tight to loose or loose to tight, you can say that a lot of different ways. The word is actually, what's so fascinating is the word isn't even dwelt technically. Oh, so no. if you were to get technically this uh, eskinosin, this, this technical term would be set up a tent or tabernacle. Ah, okay, okay. So, but there's, there's only a couple of English translations that use the word tabernacled. And I, I can't find any that say set up a tent. Oh. So the word Jesus became flesh, God became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. Or some translations say made his home among us. Some translations say took up residence with us. Uh, and, and one translation, and, and I just, it's loose, but one translation, which is really interesting to me, is, uh, and, 
moved into the neighborhood. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. No kidding. Right? So we've got this whole spectrum of translations there for John 1.14. Which one is the most accurate? That's, that's a question people, well, we're the most accurate translation. No, this one's the most accurate. Well, which one is the most accurate? It, it's a difficult question to answer because an interpreter has to be reliable mm. to the original text, the original message, but to be effective... They also have to translate it in a way that the hearer or the reader can understand. So, and that's why nobody uses the word tabernacled. What's Mm. interesting (laughs) is that a Bible scholar wishes they would have used the word tabernacled because it's it's amazing. Because then you have this whole Old Testament imagery of the tabernacle and God residing there, but so that we can we can help people understand in English today, because nobody tabernacles today right? And the only reason you would set up a tent is if you're going camping, uh, or in, this is an interesting thought, or if you're homeless, perhaps, and you have a tent. And did, so Jesus kind of had no place to lay his head. It's, a, it's, it's just fascinating yeah. all the ways you can translate even one word in, the, in one of the most popular verses that we have. A couple things. One, that is so, so helpful. If we could just clip that. We're going to have to make that Instagram real because that is so helpful the way that you put it. And then two, the next time my wife and I go camping in Mammoth, we're just going to tell everyone (laughs) we're tabernacling and (laughs) let them, let them decide what that means. Uh, But you know, I think a hard, okay, so that, that is so helpful. But what do you do when you have the critic, when you have the skeptic and they say, Mm -hmm. okay, I can get why this one's translated word for word. This one's translated, blah, blah, blah. But it seems like there are differences in different versions of the Bible. That there are, uh, you know, our our friend uh, Michael Icona, Dr. Michael Icona, has written a whole book about this, um, which is more about the, 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 the original text. But as someone who's super passionate about Scripture and you love the Bible, what do you... What do you do when the when the when the critic comes and the skeptic comes, and they start laying all these accusations against kind of the work of your life, the Bible? Well, it's it's uh, one reason why we should be reading multiple versions. It's good to try to understand uh, where what people are are uh, trying to communicate as they're interpreting scripture. So. Uh, I don't actually think there are that many discrepancies out there in what we have in the bulk Mm. of our trustworthy English translations. So any perceived discrepancies are likely going to be pretty small. And uh, if there does seem to be a significant difference between different translations, I think it's worthwhile then to see, okay, so this translation comes from this background in this Christian history, this this translation comes from this background in Christian history. This was the translating team, and maybe they had certain concerns, and so it's good to try to understand that human element, Raj, right. in the middle of all of it. And it's it's one reason why it's really good. If you if you want to be a good scholar and studier of Scripture, then, then have multiple translations mm. open to you. I love BibleGateway.com because okay. of that, or the YouVersion app, yep. because you can actually look at multiple translations and say, what does the RSV say here? What does the ESV, what does the NIV say? What does the NLT say? And occasionally you're going to see some variations that may help you understand the original intention of that uh, particular message in that part of the Bible. So I know you have uh, emotional connections with a lot of different uh, versions. I know you've worked with, you know, like Eugene Peterson, for example, you've, you've done a lot of stuff with different versions. So let me ask you a kind of broad question and not to put you on the spot, but like, let's say we have a newbie guy, a newbie Christian, a newbie person who, who wants to pick up a Bible and be like, okay, this one's the way I, this is, this is the version I should rock with. Is there a version or two that you would say, hey, this is, and not to exclude other ones, but this is, this is what I'd recommend you start with. Uh, I love the NLT, the New Living Translation, and uh, its its readability is really nice. So as a youth worker, as a youth pastor myself, it's the one I usually recommend for for uh, for teenagers. So it's it's kind of written, uh, you know, for like a seventh eighth grade English level, which is kind of a, a normal. American English reading level. So mm. it, it would be like a Harry Potter sort of 
uh, readability. Uh, like so it. it's something that can be be read by a lot of people and understood. But if I want to really understand some certain passages that seem, hey, maybe I should dig into this deeper, I pull out the NIV Study Bible or the oh. ESV Study Bible, and then I, I put all of them out on a table or on my app, and I look through them, because there are going to be some, some more word-for-word choices, like in the ESV, that are going to draw some things out that I might mm. not realize in the New Living Translation. So I love putting all of those together. So you helped create something that's kind of famous at this point now. It's called the Jesus-Centered Bible, famous for its its blue letters. Explain exactly what that is. Yeah, uh, with the team from Group Publishing, Rick Lawrence, uh, a good friend of mine in youth ministry, was the general editor. We wanted the next generation to see Jesus in all of the pages of the Bible, because the Bible really is about Jesus, and the next generation doesn't know that necessarily. They think it's their grandma's old dusty book on a shelf, Raj. So we wanted to just take moments to point out these amazing spots that that are connected to Jesus. So we pick 700 places, places where he walked, or ancestors of his, or uh, prophecies that point to him, and we made connections to Jesus, and we put them in blue. The Make a Difference Bible. The Make a Difference Bible. Yeah, the Make a Difference Bible is a youth Bible that uh, is meant to kind of give people a kick in their soul to get up off their couch, so to speak, of faith and actually go do something. So every comment in the Make a Difference Bible is an action step. So every bit of commentary, it's like, hey, God is changing you through his word as you encounter his Holy Spirit in his word, and now he wants you to go change the world. He wants to empower you to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So it's it's kind of a fun thing, Rush. That's super exciting. So Ken, a lot yeah. of the... I guess you could say doubt, but more of the the questions that we get on this channel uh, deal with the Old Testament. And obviously, you're a Bible nerd. You're 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 the can I trust the Bible Bible guy? <laughs> oh, you're obviously not scared of the Old Testament. In fact, I would go as far to say that you mm. love the Old Testament. What do you do when you're when you're you're crushing scripture and you're like, okay, Deuteronomy six, okay, hero Israel, like, or I can, I can get behind that, or. Or, you know, be still, know that I'm God. I can get behind that. Or, or, you know, Psalm 23, I can get behind that. But then you start reading Joshua and Judges and like these things with eyes and Ezekiel. You're like, what is happening? What would you, what would be your encouragement to people that are struggling with the Old Testament? Well, it's, it's interesting to me that most of our nation and even a lot of Christians don't struggle with watching things on TV that are graphic Come and on. filled with things that are uncomfortable, right? So what's, what's wild to me is all the great stories that we are interested in today are actually already in Scripture. So you can't read the book of Judges without seeing all of the graphic, nasty stuff that's on TV today. And we have to, be, we have to wrestle with that. We have to go, what in the world is going on in here? And, I, you know, I, I strike it up, Raj, a lot of the, the amazing raw brutality and questionable things that are in the Bible, that's God just saying, humans— this is your reflection of your own image. Wow. This is what you look like. And, and part of the message of the Bible is to reveal to us who God is, and then to reveal to us who we are, or maybe even more so, who we have become. Because we were created in God's image, and God wants us to see that in his scripture. But then we've developed this self-image instead, this imago ego instead of an imago Ooh. day. And, uh, and so that's the book of Judges, man. So if you want to know how bad we are as humans and how far we've gotten from the Imago Dei, you've got to read the Old Testament because it, there's stuff in there. You're just like, what? <laughs> what in the world? This... So I love the Old Testament for that. So when Jesus comes on the scene, it's, it's so refreshing. And it's like, we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this Messiah. We've been waiting for this person to recreate us in the image of God as his masterpiece. So that's, that's the story of the Bible right there. And it's why we need to translate it, Raj, and get it into everybody's hands. Look at the way you just bow tied that. You should be your own podcast. It looks like <laughs> by, the, by your setup that you are. So how can people find you? Uh, you know, it, the place I'd love people to find me right now is at makeadifferencebible.com. So we are, we're really excited about this and, and getting this word out to the next generation. Deuteronomy 6, you mentioned it. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, 
and soul and strength, and we're supposed to follow his commands. And the first command he gives there is to teach that to the next generation. Come on. So let's let's get the word of God and his commands and, and his patterns uh, into the hands in a way that the next generation can do something with it. All right, speaking of next gen, you know, we met when I used to help co-lead a, a next gen initiative called Israel Collective. We met in Israel. So right. as the Bible guy, was there... Was there something about our trip that stuck out to you? Oh, I loved it. You know, uh, you asked me while we were on that trip if I would give a little message in the garden tomb area before we took communion. And that was just so special, Raj. So I've been to Israel three times, and um, there's, there's nothing like being in the land that Jesus walked where he chose to tabernacle among us, and he chose to interact uh, he chose to cry with us and and eat with us and uh, spend life with us. And so to be able to open up his word and to walk through scripture, revealing all these things, I, I couldn't help but to have in my mind uh, in Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus, and Jesus opened up scripture to these two guys he's walking with, and he, he told everything from the, the law of Moses and the prophets that pointed to him. And I, I couldn't help but think, think of that uh, while we were there at the garden tomb. So thank you for giving me that opportunity to just walk through Scripture and reveal Jesus. Love it, love it. Well, a couple more questions. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about how Jesus is found throughout all 66 books of the Bible. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, what would your, your word of advice to people say, well, I'm a Jesus guy. All I need are the red letters. In other words, all I need are, in fact, the only thing that's valid is that which Jesus said explicitly in the four gospels where, you know, he, this is him verbatim speaking. What would you say to someone who has that opinion of Jesus in the Bible? Well, I think you're belittling Jesus. So you've, you've got to want to know him. So what if I said that about my wife? Like, oh yeah, I totally love my wife, but only when I'm with her and can hear her talking. Like, why wouldn't I care about the whole rest of her life? Do I not want to know what she's been doing at work? Do I not want to know who her family is? Do I not want to go back into the history of who she is and, and her experience as a kid? Do I not want to get excited about the things she gets excited about? Do I not want to just keep asking her questions and find out more? And the, the more, if I really love my wife, I want to get to know her more and more and more. And the, the Bible is God's way of saying, here I am, you Come guys. On. Come, come and know me. Like, do you want to know me? Here I am. You, you got to know my whole story here. So it's, it's just so belittling to Jesus to just say, yeah, I only care about the stuff that he said in, in red letters. Well, the whole thing is what he said. He's come the on. word of God. And when come he on. speaks, uh, he wants us to listen. So Wow. Yeah. Preach, preach. If I'm ever up in Minnesota, man, I'm coming to, to see you, to hear you preach, man, because I uh, <laughs> I'm I am so just excited about everything that you're doing. Uh, one or two more quick questions. Obviously, the Bible is super close to your heart, and you're super passionate about it. And it doesn't take long to stumble on YouTube and find all of these things just trashing the Bible. What mm. is your favorite apologetic? What is your favorite um, argument? Arguments, whatever you might be, that you would give a young person, or who cares how old they are? to help them intellectually with the Bible? Well, it, it, not only is it an irrefutable argument from beginning to end, it, uh, it's, it's an incredibly historical argument. So we're talking about translations today. We have, we have thousands of ancient manuscripts that affirm what we have in our hands as being accurate and trustworthy and reliable. So uh, that's undebatable. And uh, we, we're even finding new manuscripts like the Qumran Caves in the last 70 years. And we open these up. They haven't been open for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet they are, they are so accurately affirming what we already had, right? So there's tons of historicity to what we have in Scripture today. But there's also historicity in its pages. One of my favorite things to point to is Romans 16. This is a list of like 40 names of people. And if you're, <laughs> this is Paul, a guy uh, doing social media moment with all of his friends 
2,000 years before Instagram and TikTok, right? So he is saying, say hello to so-and-so and say hello to so-and-so. And, and there's just this, this genuine relational aspect to it. And then he's pointing out names in there that we actually have evidence of nowadays, like a guy named Erastus, uh, city treasurer in Corinth, that sort of thing. And, and we can go to Corinth today and see his name. Wow. So there's just so many cool little historical evidences and you know that, Raj, from all of your trips to Israel. Uh, Magdala, you can walk those streets and see where Jesus stood in the, yes, in the uh, synagogue. It's incredible. All right, last question uh, for the Bible guy, my buddy Ken. Um, so someone clicked on this video. They have questions about translations. They have questions about the Bible. And you've answered them brilliantly with, with responses full of the Holy Spirit. But maybe... Let's take it a little bit from the head and, and, and take it to the heart. Last mm. question. Mm -hmm. my, my buddy here who, who just clicked on this video, ah, this whole Jesus Christianity Bible thing, I don't know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what this Ken guy has to say. What would you say to someone who's like, mm, okay, maybe, uh, but I, I'm not sure, but they've clicked here and they're, and, they're, and they're watching you right now. What would be your encouragement to give the Bible, Jesus, Christianity a try? I think any, any other option that we choose to stake our lives by is something that actually keeps us from being strong. So here's what I mean by that. If you plant a tree and you're tempted to stake it in the ground with twine, and you know what that tree doesn't have to do? That tree doesn't have to develop roots. That tree doesn't have to develop a strong trunk. And if you take the stakes away and a storm comes, that tree gets destroyed. It gets uprooted or blown over, or you'll see you'll see new trees that the stakes have been taken away. You'll see the trunk split in half after a big storm because the trunk didn't have to grow strong. The difference about Jesus, the difference about his word, is that he doesn't provide stakes for you to kind of hold you up. You actually get to grow down into him, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. You get to root into him, and he builds you up strong and vigorous in the truth that you've been taught. And then you overflow with thanksgiving for all he's done. That's Colossians 2, 6, and 7. That's Psalm chapter 1. That's Ephesians 3. That is on and on. This imagery of the tree is an imagery of the people of God throughout Scripture. So it's the, it's, to me, it's the only infrastructure plan you can have for your life where it actually values you enough as a person that God says, uh, root down into me, remain in me, connect with me, and I will help you to stand strong through the storms. Not un, not without blemish, you know, not without trouble. But in this world, you will have troubles. It's the Bible is honest and raw, but it its message and the encounter you'll have with God, the life saving count encounter you'll have with God and a relationship with Jesus will root you down deeply so you can stand strong and flourishing in every season and overflow with a productivity of life that people can't just easily explain. Wow. Ken, you are uh, a hero of mine. I love you to death. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks, Rosh. Love you too. And love what you're doing here with this show. Thanks for doing this. Well, I appreciate it. And if you want more content just like that, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload.